Call to order. Uh, public forums up first. Anybody want to come up and say anything? Okay, we'll take that as a no. Um, <laughs> approval of our minutes from our September 9 meeting. Um, there's some meeting minutes, but if anybody has any changes or corrections or anything, otherwise, no. we will entertain a motion to approve. I move we approve the submitted. All second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Now to the highlight of the evening. Um, we have our spring 2020 special project grant applications, and we have the hearings for that. Um, we have, what do we got? We have uh, $4,480 to distribute for these. So uh, we look forward to hearing the presentations by the groups making requests this year. Um, so uh, first up, if we can have the uh, Ames Town and Gown. Thank you. Uh, I'm Bruce Calhoun, uh, president of Amestown Gown Chamber Music Association. And I'll, uh, I think I'll just read the text that you have in front of you just, just so everybody can hear exactly what we're applying for. Um, we are asking for funding to support presentation of master classes by town gown guest artists Anthony and Damari McGill. The McGill brothers will be presenting a concert with pianist Michael McHale. Anthony McGill, principal clarinetist of the New York Philharmonic, is also remembered for his performance at the inaugur inauguration of Barack Obama with Itzhak Perlman <coughs> and Yo-Yo Ma. Damari McGill, recipient of the prestigious Avery Fisher Career Grant, currently serves as principal flute of the Seattle Symphony. Master class participants will be selected from the Iowa State University Music Department uh, student body and from among high school students. Attendees at these events will be free. Attendance at these events will be free and open to the public. Town and Gown has obtained a $500 donation to support this event and we're requesting funding for the remainder from uh, CODA. And uh, so I guess, first of all, I just ask if you have any questions uh, from us. Do they both play the flute? Pardon me? Do both brothers play the flute? No, uh, Anthony McGill plays the clarinet and, and uh, is, is on the faculty, teaches the clarinet at, Cur at Juilliard School, Curtis Institute in Philadelphia cool. and Bard, uh, college conservatory. So 
he's an expert at teaching too. So this, mm -hmm. and then uh, uh, Damari McGill is on the faculty at Cin the Cincinnati Conservatory. So both of these uh, performers are also teachers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we we look at this as a as a, a, a real effort to collaborate with the, the Iowa State and the high school. Possibly even younger younger kids might be in the audience uh, to to uh, really develop and continue to develop an interest in music at, in the Ames schools. We've we've had um, we had a quartet that came here last year, and and when they left the high school, they said that Ames High music department was probably better than most university music departments. They mm -hmm. went to it. I think part of it is is that we can provide some of these types of outreaches for, for kids that don't normally get this kind of exposure. So um, really that's in a nutshell. You, what you say you're reaching an audience of 50 people. Is there gonna be more than that with any traveling about to the school or? Any more? More, more than, than just the 50 people in the audience you list here? We, you know, it's hard to tell. We, um, usually what happens is we, this would be at Iowa State, so there's plenty of room. Uh, these, these performers would probably play a little bit for them, tell a little bit about the instruments. I, I would guess there'd um, be some professors there, some possibly some people just from the community. Uh, there might be some elementary kids, their parents, even though they aren't, participating in the in the workshops they they'd be able to sit in and, and listen um, and then the actual participants so we we hope for 50 and we would obviously welcome more if if we can reach them and, and get them to come <coughs> um, you have master classes are they going to do two three what are they doing well um, I really think it's just one. <laughs> so it's going to be one. Okay. I, I'm not. It's two. Each performer does the one, so there'll be two masters. Okay. So so that's the that's how they're breaking. One brother will do one, one and the other. One there uh, instead of yeah. One each performer will go over their instrument and work with with people. So I guess we call that two. <laughs> <laughs> Makes sense. Anyway, it's, it's so are packaged. you gonna, are the students who come are they going to be specially selected or can yes. they just yeah, so uh, they'll be selected by the faculty or the okay. the teachers at Ames High. Okay. So they would probably identify students that would benefit the most. So both Iowa State students and Ames High yeah. students. Okay. And, and interesting thing is the professor of clarinet will be traveling abroad at that time, and he's going to actually come back here for this. He's so excited about it. Oh, wow. <laughs> so uh, it's pretty significant, I think, uh, mm -hmm. for them. He should have applied for a grant to cover his travel costs. <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't thinking. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Nope. Mm -mm. All right. OK. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, next up, uh, Central Iowa Touring Ensemble. <clears throat> Hello, <laughs> my name is Ben Siegel and I'm from Central Iowa Touring Ensemble. Central Iowa Touring Ensemble is a nonprofit theater company founded by high school students that's devoted to spreading empathy in our schools and the broader community of Ames. And we try to do this by creating productions that are specifically created for young audiences, especially primary school audiences. Um, so we're going to elementary schools and we're bringing stories that teach empathy and we're creating these stories with an ensemble of high school students. So this spring we have a project we're really excited about. We're hoping to produce <coughs> Junie B. Jones the Musical, which is a show that we think fits perfectly with this mission. It really, it talks about in a fun and energetic way. It talks about empathy and kindness and it reaches our target audience so effectively as it's talking about accepting others and being a good friend. And it really exercises the power of the arts. Without being like an in-your-face lesson, it shows kids how to exercise empathy and it shows kids how to exercise optimism and embrace adventure. So it's a really exciting story to be able to bring to schools because the arts have a power to influence kids, 
especially arts created specifically for them in a way that just a lecture or a book simply couldn't. They're there experiencing with these artists what it looks like to exercise empathy and they're experiencing the energy of this whole experience. So we think it's so important to bring this story to as many students as possible. So in order to do that, we're hoping to tour the show to different schools and arts organizations and libraries in the community. By doing this, we're able to reach a lot of audiences that typically wouldn't be able to see theater. So even if maybe they wouldn't have the financial or transportation or whatever means to normally come <laughs> see a piece of theater, there's all these kids that get the experience of watching our piece of theater. And we're reaching a lot of underserved children and giving a lot of people their first ever experience to see theater. And then also this project obviously is a great education opportunity for the young adults working on the show. We have students producing, directing, stage managing, designing, acting, doing all the different elements of this production. And by doing this, we're learning so much about effective storytelling, about communication, about teamwork, about creativity. We're learning all these super important skills together too. So it's great for youth on both sides. It's We're spreading a really effective message through our theater, but we're also learning a lot ourselves Ourselves, and this is really important for the arts community. Of course, producing a full-scale show like this is very expensive, <laughs> um, and that's one of our big obstacles in creating these projects that we're so excited about. Licensing is really our biggest fee. That's super, it's a hefty fee for us, but then also space rental for public performances to make sure this can reach the public. Um, advertising, costumes, set, um, sound, props, supplies, all of these costs add up. So even though we do work really hard through crowdfunding and free will donations and our sponsorship program to raise these funds ourselves, we do need additional support. Um, so we want to reach this community really badly with Junie B. Jones, the musical. We want to promote empathy and we want to promote positivity. And we want to demonstrate the power of the arts as a way to inspire and educate and teach and impact. <coughs> but in order to do this, we need your help. At this time, I'd like to open it up to questions. <laughs> Um, so you did something like this last year? We did, yes. yes. So last year we produced a production of Freckle Face Strawberry, the musical, which is pretty similar in terms of scale of production. Uh -huh. And we also toured that to local schools. The biggest difference for this year is, of course, different show and just expanding a little bit, really trying to, we saw that it worked last year. Now we're excited <laughs> and we want to bring that to even more people and reach more people with that powerful message. So we're hoping to increase the number of schools we're going to increase with just a couple more community arts organizations. Um, and in doing that, our fees also raise. Mm -hmm. So you, so if you're doing this in, in the schools and the library, why are you, why do you need space rental? Yes, so we have schools, libraries, and some public performances. So we want to bring this for completely for free to schools and libraries. And that's just a fantastic opportunity to just reach these kids. But then we also want to share this story with our broader community. So of course, they can go to the library performance. We've also, last year, we offered a public performance in Story Theater Company's um, space. Um, so for that, that's a rental fee with them. And we've also in discussion oh, okay. with a couple other other area arts organizations about <coughs> staging this in their spaces as well. And all of these are production fees. So. Hmm. But you're not, you, you're not selling when you do that more public show, that's going to, that's free and open to the public. Yes. That is free will okay. donations. Okay. okay. Any questions? Was last year the first time you did this? It is. Okay. Yes. So we were oh. founded last January. Okay. So. Well, we are excited to see you on the on the docket today. So. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> well, if enthusiasm were money, you'd be well on your way. <laughs> <laughs> so keep it up. Keep it up. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Ames Children's Choir Association is up next. Maybe we should introduce them. Yeah. I'm Sean Stevenson. I'm the operations manager for Ames Children's Choirs. I'm Francine White. I am the bookkeeper. Um, Paul Hertz. I'm on the board as the treasurer. <laughs> anyway, um, this year is the 25th anniversary of Ames Children's Choirs, and so we're planning some special events. And one of those is uh, during our spring concert, May 16th, 2020, 
we're asking alumni to come back and participate in that concert in a variety of ways, as well as being a part of a mass choir and singing with it. But also we've got uh, one of our past members is going to be conducting some of those mass choir pieces. That's going to be an afternoon concert. That same evening, we are hosting an alumni concert. We're calling it an alumni benefit concert, which we'll discuss uh, of some of those reasons in the in just a moment. But um, we are inviting past um, alumni who are currently pursuing a music career or who are already involved in a music career um, who are very talented to come and share those gifts with us either vocally or instrumentally and uh, perform a concert that evening. Is there anything else you want me to say about that? Mm -hmm. Not unless you want to. Um, as Sean mentioned, what we decided we would like to do with this alumni concert is host it as a benefit concert. Um, there's the benefit of bringing former or ECC alumni back, um, kids who grew up in this community who have made successful careers out of music and in the arts. And we think it's a great thing to bring them back, showcase to our younger singers as well as just the communities what, what people can do with um, an arts career. But also we wanted to reach out to the community in a different way. And so we, we came up with the thought that, well, let's, instead of charging admission, let's um, ask for donations to the food pantry. Um, one of our board members is very involved at one of the food pantries and, and said that that's a time of year when donations <coughs> typically um, fall quite short. Students go home for the summer and people are traveling and they're just not getting the, um, the <coughs> donations that they need to sustain. So we looked at this as a way to um, help our community in that way, as well as to make it just a more affordable concert for people who may not otherwise be able to attend the concert. Um, we do have, as, as Sean mentioned, we also have our spring concert earlier that day. So the same kids, a lot of the same families and kids and, and people who want to go to that concert would be hopefully attending the concert that evening. Um, so as you note in the budget, um, one of our, we don't have a lot of expenses. We've kept the venue fees very low thanks to the um, ability to use Iowa State's recital hall um, inexpensively. We've kept a lot of the other expenses small so that we can really focus on publicity and getting the word out. We think that's important. We have to get bodies in the door in order to get donations in the door and to have that awareness and, and really celebrate the arts that evening, we need to, to bring people in. So we really want to focus on um, publicizing widely in order to maximize the uh, attendance at the benefit concert. Did you want to talk about tuition assistance? Um, yes, the other thing <laughs> that, the only other um, financial, um, we are looking for a um, family or business sponsor for, to host our reception that evening. Um, but we also would accept free will donations that go specifically to our scholarship fund. Uh, we try to keep that very um, robust so that we can offer a lot of tuition assistance and make the choirs very accessible to people of all income levels in our community. <coughs> so do you have any questions for us? <coughs> I was just looking over the, the budget and uh, obviously we don't fund the, the reception, the 250, right. and mm -hmm. so you're right at the 25% share. So mm -hmm. I, it, it was no, I had to do the math to make sure you were at least funding that 25% mm -hmm. and you're right exactly spot on there. Right. So, All right. Okay. Great. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, actors. Hi, I'm Stan Raby, I'm with Actors. I should stand back from the microphone. Uh, <laughs> um, this winter, we are planning on doing Leading Ladies. It's a Ken Ludwig classic. For those of you who know Ken Ludwig as a playwright, you know there's always something unusual in his plots that require a challenge and something different. In this case, Leading Ladies is about uh, two washed up Shakespearean actors who find out about an old lady in York, Pennsylvania who wants to leave her fortune to her two long lost nephews. So they hike off to York, Pennsylvania and then find out that it's two long lost nieces. So they immediately take on the role 
of the two long lost nieces. Now, it's a great comedy, but already we have experienced, or we, we've already set up uh, a few of the big production challenges that this show presents. First of all, they're Shakespearean actors, so we have to have a set of, not just two, a set of Shakespearean costumes. That's not something we have upstairs in the actor's costume room. <laughs> Secondly, they have to be believable as women. And that's, depending upon the size of our men that we end up casting, that's not something we can easily do. And the third thing are the wigs, because the Shakespearean characters and the women would have wigs. So our budget for this show is fairly high. And normally we would apply for it during the normal CODA process, but our shows are selected long after the CODA goes in. So we're looking at a budget for costumes, sets, because you have various locales that have to be set up <laughs> and wigs of about, I have to look it up because as an accountant, I don't remember numbers, <laughs> um, of about $2,200 enough money to get us back into the range of what we would normally spend on, co on costumes, sets, and wigs. So we're just looking to, to cover the distance. Um, the reason why we're asking for it is that when we do our budgeting for a show, we figure out how many seats we have to sell to cover the budget. We seat 136, we have to sell 123 seats at every performance to cover the budget for the show. So we're hoping this gets us back into a range where the shows can cover it with the number of seats we have available. Questions? So this, this wasn't on the schedule for the funding the, for your annual grant? The way, the way CODA works and the way our, our season selection works is we are just starting the play selection process for the CODA grant that's due on Friday. So we don't know our shows for that season because CODA is due so much earlier than what our season is selected. And we estimate what we think our, you know, on an average show, this is what we're gonna spend. And that's how we put together the CODA grant application. But this one is, unique enough and it's <clears throat> expensive enough, we're hoping to bridge the gap. Um, we know, for instance, musicals cost a lot of money. So we're doing the CODA grant application. We figure a much larger, mm -hmm. but our January, our January comedy is usually a little farce. But you know, it's, it's a drawing room set, mm -hmm. it's common, costumes, that kind of thing, and this one isn't that. Mm -hmm. It's a great show, by the way. It is hysterically funny. Do you get to keep the wigs? <laughs> um, or do you have to rent them? No, we will buy them. We buy cheap wigs <laughs> so that by the time they get pulled on probably 10 times for rehearsal and performance, they're kind of beaten to an inch of their existence. <laughs> We're not buying the kind that anybody would really wear because <clears throat> we're too we're rough on them. Mm -hmm. okay. And especially they, oh, these are all fast costume changes. I mean like they walk off, they change their back on just like that. So those wigs will get beaten up pretty badly <laughs> during the run of the show. But if you want one, Steve. Uh, after the show. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Halloween's coming up, show? although we won't have them until <laughs> We're simile impaired. I would uh, <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Any other questions? All right. Thank you, Stan. Thanks. Uh, India Cultural Association. Hi, my name is Anand. And uh, first off, thanks for the opportunity. And you'll have to forgive my nervousness. This is my first time doing it uh, in terms of fundraising or anything. So looking at Siegel and those guys present, oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> so it's going to be hard to compete. But um, so 
what we want to do, so I see a typical past to put together very classical performances. Even last year, we bought in, uh, I mean, to scale back a little bit, but we usually, you know, we're trying to kind of tell people about the Indian culture, Indian stories, dance. Um, performances, we are finding it hard to bring people in. How much ever we try, it brings in the older generation, but middle class, I mean, sorry, like the somewhat younger folks or even children, even if we are like, you know, giving away the tickets for free at high schools, it's just proving hard to get them in. So what we want to do this year, it's kind of an experiment. You know, this is the first time I actually heard that there was a special grant. And so we're like kind of trying it uh, in the sense our theory is that if we actually put up a play which tells an Indian story, so we would just want to tell an Indian story, comical or not, uh, in English, so we can bring in like you know multiple communities which have like similar cultural nuances, etc., to the theater, and it'll be in English, so it's easy to understand, so it's easy to sell the you know play, etc. So that's our intent. So we've been uh, so this is the first time we're going to do it. We have almost no experience getting you know, put together a play. So what like I personally have done is we have like, contacted some troops in uh, California to see if they can come perform over here. These are Indian artists and, you know, the one that I put in the application, they're one of the biggest Indian theaters in uh, the U.S. But other ideas we've had is like I've also reached out to uh, the Story County Theater over here to see if there's a way we can collaborate to actually work with the Indian community over here to put a play in that way. I mean, the intent is just to put an Indian story out there. And so that's that's what we are uh, looking for. So we've asked for like a thousand dollars. Typically, that helps us. In, uh, you know, we put almost all of our events at the Aim City Auditorium. So that alone, you know, costs like a thousand dollars, etc. Apart from that, we sell tickets uh, to make up for the costs of, you know, the artists and so on and so forth. Any questions? No questions. Wow. <laughs> when, you, when would you plan on doing this? So this would be in spring 2020. Okay. Do you know the play? Oh, we don't like, so I, we don't know the play exactly. Uh, we've re like, I've reached out to guys in California uh, and they have like, you know, plays like on Gandhi, etc. But I don't know the exact play. We haven't nailed it just yet. <laughs> but we do know we want to get a play into town to like, see if it, pro like if we can get more people in. So. Questions? All right. All right. Thanks it's so much. Fine. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Octagon Center. Greetings. Uh, my name is Heather Johnson. I'm the director at the Octagon Center for the Arts. And our spring 2020 project grant is uh, about the business of art seminar. We're teaming together with the Ames Community Arts Council for a two-day seminar. Uh, it would be March 6th and 7th of 2020. And it's open to artists uh, as well as creatives um, that may be authors and people that may not do just traditional art um, work with pen and paper painting. Um, we are going to uh, have professional artists and other specialists be brought in to present on topics including categories about taxes, financial planning, legal matters, uh, copyright protection, contracts, insurance, um, portfolio presentations, photography of artwork, sales of artwork, commissions, um, marketing, publishing, wellness, and self-care. Um, and so <laughs> we as a small nonprofit, um, we have reached out to even some speakers that may be in Illinois, Minnesota, in Omaha. And so we're requesting some CODA funding to help with very modest honoraria. Basically, that would just help cover pretty much just their gas money. So um, this is a very, we feel a very important way to help promote arts. Um, a lot of artists may not know how to run a business or had, you know, any backing or experience or 
classes in that. So we, as an art center, think it's very important to help provide the education to artists. Um, and we're expecting about 85 people, and we would actually have room for even 125. And we would also partner together with college students as well who may be in that field of interest. And we're going to be working with them to even offer, um, if they volunteer, for a free uh, opportunity to attend the seminar. Have you done these before? We did. Our first, 2019 was our first one. So when the operational was submitted, it was just starting to be an idea. We didn't even know yet. So that's why... Um, it's an addition. And also, um, since that code of operational funding, we expected like a two or three percent increase in operation. But because of the additional organizations being added to the pool, we actually are down um, almost three percent. So instead of like getting a, almost a five percent increase, we're down. So um, that's also another reason that this would be very helpful as well. Would you think about putting this in your annual request in the future? Do you think this is something that's going to keep? We we going? hope so. Yeah, that would be great. Um, yeah, it, and so we would hopefully see that second year being a boost, and it's definitely a need we've heard from many. Because you feel artists. like it was successful the first mm -hmm. go round. Yep. Yeah. <clears throat> Heather, how do you get the word out to the artists? Great question. So we are part of a lot of different social media groups, art organizations, um, guilds, um, you know, through art festivals as well. We have a lot of email addresses. Um, so a lot of it's social media. And we find that artists, once they hear about it, will share it with their friends who are also, um, a lot of them are connected with other artist groups or guilds. So we find that email and e-blast and Facebook ads really has gone pretty far. Any other questions? Anybody? All right. All thank right. you. Thank you. Um, last but not least, actually, it is the least request. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Story Theater Company. Hi, my name is Amy Devine. I'm a board member at Story Theater Company. And I'm Sue Ann Peters. I'm the treasurer at Story Theater Company. And we are asking for this year um, some money to provide um, American Sign Language interpretation at one of our shows. So this came up um, in the spring at our performance of Mary Poppins. We got a request for an ASL interpreter, um, which we were happy to provide. And we realized that there was this whole part of the community that we were not serving. Um, because we had never provided it before. So um, this, this all came about after we had done our budget for this year. And so we decided we committed the, the money to provide the interpreter for our fall show in the auditorium, but we were asking for the funds to do it for our spring musical for Frozen. And that's pretty much it in a nutshell. <laughs> you mentioned 2,000. Is that total audience, or is that people who would be deaf and hearing impaired? Or? That's our total audience. Okay. Yes. And that's based on our numbers from our spring show, from our Mary Poppins attendance. And have you got somebody lined up that's done this type of thing before? We, the, in the, the spring, we... type of signing, I guess, than just like yes, Skyping or something? Yes, we found um, interpreters in Des Moines, I believe. Um, and they come in in pairs so oh. that they can, they can dialogue with the actors. Um, so we would okay. do the same thing again. Okay. Questions? Terrific. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, that's all the um, presentations we have um, for the requests uh, for the spring 2020 special grant. We have about 4500 bucks to distribute. We have about $6,000 in requests. So we'll do our best to uh, spread the wealth and do what we can for all the organizations that have come before us um, today. So I thank you all for coming and for... Um, uh, sticking around for your uh, colleagues' presentations, too. I think that kind of support um, is noted. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Anything else on that item? We good? All right. So um, we're going to move on to the next one. At the last meeting, we had um, the gentleman who uh, oversees the auditorium come and speak. That prompted some questions about 
the history of funding, where funding for the arts is heading headed in the community. Um, I did have a, a brief informal conversation with a city council person who happened to be working at the beer and wine tasting at Wheatsfield. Um, <laughs> And uh, uh, she was unaware of any arts workshop. I believe there was an arts workshop mentioned as a possibility of the city council possibly doing. She was not aware of anything. So um, that's as far as I got with that inquiry. But I think maybe we were interested in gathering some more input from our organizations about some, cons um, some concerns or ideas they may have about um, where they see their needs heading. I think that would be an accurate way of putting it. Um, so we wanted to talk a little bit about how we might um, solicit uh, that input. Um, probably the most efficient, I guess, just to start off any conversation would be to put together a, some sort of survey mm -hmm. um, that we could send out to um, groups that have traditionally sought support from CODA. Um, I don't think it needs to be very long, um, just to give them an opportunity to um, respond to a couple questions and then maybe fill us in on what their biggest challenges are um, and where they see their organizations heading. I think we also probably might behoove us to um, see what communities of similar size are doing. Um, and I can try and I can try and take that on. I think if I can figure out the best, way to go about that. Um, it could be as easy as that recent, oh, come up to the podium. Um, it could be a, a <laughs> <coughs> oh, hi, I'm sorry, I didn't know you were back there. So. <laughs> uh, yeah, so kind of going off of that, um, the Octagon as a community art center, we have actually reached out to some other around the state uh, art centers to see what kind of their funding um, sources are too. So we do have some of that that we'd be happy to share too with, Absolutely. with either the you know commissioners or the city council. Um, but yeah, so we do have some of that already on file here just in the last couple of months. Okay, good, thank you. Okay. It's good to see you all again. And uh, I would say that I also have been doing a lot of research on this and over the course of the past year, one suggestion I might make, um, is reaching out to Jennifer Drinkwater at Iowa State University. Um, her job with the Extension Outreach Center is uh, community arts. So she is in touch with all of the communities in this state. Um, and she has a lot of good examples of uh, communities in other states and what they are doing and, and how they're funding things. Um, and she's actually, she and I have met before and talked a lot about, uh, and she filled my head up with so many examples, I can't even remember all of them. Um, so she would be a great resource to reach out to as well. Great, thank you. Because a lot of this, the thing is, a lot of this research and data it does already exist. Yeah, you know, it's good to find out information from from all the folks in the community, but a lot of the numbers are already out there. Um, and somebody like Jennifer would be a good person to connect you with all okay. those. Okay, that's great. Thank you. And I'm happy. I'm happy to pass her information on to you as well. Okay. Um, maybe we need to assign some stuff. Can we have a subcommittee with that? Is that like, if like two of us want to yeah, you can. reach out to um, Drinkwater? What was her first name? Jennifer. 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 Jennifer Drinkwater. If there's maybe two people who want to volunteer to do that. Happy to do it. Okay. Either that or working on the form. I'm game for either one. So. Um, why don't I get the form going? Okay. And then I can run it by everybody. And then... We'll go from there, but if maybe two of you will volunteer to reach out to Jennifer Drinkwater and get whatever information is. Yep. Yeah. You guys? Sure. Perfect. Okay. And we'll just start those steps going and <laughs> see how long it takes. Get a drop in on her. <laughs> <laughs> so, Ask her in the hallway. <laughs> so this is just general areas for funding needs rather than space, or is it? Well, I think we want a kind of a understanding of what what the, our groups, our organizations are seeing as challenges and opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, funding, of course, is going to be probably top of the heap, but maybe there are some other things. Uh, maybe one group has a need that another group might be able to fill. If we have kind of a big picture, um, if we ask the right questions and get the right kind of input, I think it will, um, opportunities will reveal themselves if it goes right. <laughs>
Um, so why don't we plan on having, I will plan on having a draft of the survey ready by the next meeting. I know we were trying to do things in terms of the next budget hearing, but I guess I'd rather do a complete job than worry about rushing to a certain point because this is going to take more discussion than just popping in front of the city council um, when they do their budget hearings. I think it's probably going to take, once we know what we might, have opportunities for, um, I think it's going to take a little bit more than just that. Yeah. <laughs> we'll have to bribe people. <laughs> Strike that. <laughs> That's what the mute button is for, I think. <laughs> I said beg. <laughs> okay, does that sound good? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, great. Work. Okay. Yeah, we'll, good. We'll hear back from her by then, too. Yes, perfect. Okay. Um, our upcoming important dates. Reminder, the 2020-21 annual grant applications are due, well, tomorrow, looks <laughs> like. Mm -hmm. And then our annual grant hearing is going to be November. Um, and then our next meeting will, of course, be November 4, too. So um, I'm typically traveling then, but I'm not this year. So I get to be here. <laughs> I missed the last one. Um, okay. Anything else in the order of those? That's what they signed up for a couple months ago. Is that what that? Yes. Was? Okay. It is. Okay. Any other comments, questions, or anything? If not, entertain a motion to it. Oh, nope. yes, please. Um, Paul Hertz, Ames Children's Choirs. Um, um, with relation to um, talking to Jennifer Drinkwater. a general email to the Iowa Arts Council about any of that. I'm, I'm sure they have that. And then they certainly have affiliate organizations, um, organizations that sometimes they're more similar to ACAC here or to CODA or to the Octagon and whatnot. And that's, that's another strong. Yeah. Okay. I'll just, to follow up with what Paul said, um, currently the position the community specialist position within the Iowa Arts Council is vacant. Um, so they don't really have anybody. Um, but I do have a few contacts there as well if, if, if you're interested in reaching out to them. Um, I don't, I've tried to pull some of that information from them as well. Um, it's, it's a little hard to get at. Um, so I'm not sure exactly what they would have, especially since that position is, is currently, currently not available. Mm. But okay. I'm still happy to connect you if you'd want to be. Great. That's good to know. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for all the input from everybody. Um, okay. Motion to adjourn? I move we adjourn. All right. So moved. All in favor, we're adjourned. <laughs>